Welcome to I Love to Tell the Story, a podcast on the Narrative Lectionary. I'm Rolf Jacobson. I'm Catherine Schifferdecker. I'm Joy J. Moore. This is the podcast on Mark 13. Uh, it's for um, the fifth Sunday in Lent, 2024, March 17th. Happy St. Patrick's Day uh, to go. all my Roman Catholic friends uh, and Irish friends, too, and anybody who just celebrates driving snakes out of desert, uh, excuse me, out of island countries. Um, no, I just turned the river green in Chicago, okay? Don't yeah, well, there is that. There is that, right? I went to an Irish college, and I'll just say, I, as I was a Norwegian Protestant kid, and somebody goes, my senior year, Patty May, and he says, happy St. Patrick's Day. And I said, I'm, I'm not Irish. She goes, Rolf, on St. Patrick's Day, everyone's Irish. She just made me feel <laughs> welcome. I mean, I just felt like, okay, thanks. You, 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 that's like, that's what hospitality looks like. But this is uh, Mark 13, and I think this is one of the texts that really, sh and, and choices in the narrative lectionary that really shows how the narrative lectionary helps us understand the Bible differently than the regular lectionary. In the in the church year lectionary, uh, the revised common lectionary that is built from um, December through November, essentially, this text occurs in November at the end of the year because in theory, uh, or at least in interpretation, the text is about the second coming. So, so they put it there. But actually, in context, when you're reading this right before Holy Week, um, you, you, it sounds very different. Jesus is telling these before he goes uh, to his, well, the ending of the first coming. And he says this at the end in verses 35 uh, and 36. Keep awake, for you do not know when the master of the house will come in the evening at midnight, at cock crow, or at dawn. Well, if you think about it, evening, midnight, cock crow, dawn, those are, those are the moments of Christ's passion. Here they are in the evening. It's the Last Supper. It's the waiting in the garden. It's the betrayal at midnight. Then at cock crow, Peter's denial of Jesus three times. And then when dawn comes, uh, you know, uh, the the passion of the Christ as he's put to death. And so I really think this text right before Holy Week help us, helps us hear the text differently, and it helps us understand the events of the passion differently. Yeah, that, that's really helpful, Ralph. Thanks. The, yeah, we're used, to, we're used to hearing these texts around Christ the King Sunday, mm -hmm. uh, which, which also has its own, you know, appropriate nature as we move into Advent and the, the idea of Christ's first coming and second coming. But hearing it now in Lent, uh, not long before Holy Week, um, in fact, right before Holy Week, uh, it, it does have a different uh, kind of sense to it because, of course, um, the passion of Jesus, the uh, the death of Jesus, is um, is is a is a huge event, is a traumatic event uh, for the mm. disciples, uh, and. And Jesus says to them, right, keep watch. What I say to you, I say to all, keep awake, right? Uh, and of course, that brings up images of the, the Garden of Gethsemane and the disciples not being able to keep awake. But in a larger sense as well, right? Keep awake, keep alert. You don't understand what's going to happen, but I do. Uh, so so keep, yeah, uh, uh, keep watch with me. As you, as you noted, this was a, a, a major event, a significant event in the, in the life of the disciples. And what do you do when a tragedy occurs that uh, was unexpected? Um, you rehearse the last things you remember before that tragedy occurs. You repeat it. And, and so I can think of uh, in fear in trying to understand uh, uh, right after the crucifixion and before the resurrection, what were the things that he said to us? Mm. And, and so these these words being um, uh, stuck into their, their their memory, but then after the resurrection, when the stories are passed along, they have greater memory, uh, greater meaning uh, for the disciples. And in a similar way, uh, reading this. In, in the anticipation of uh, Jesus' passion. Uh, 
and then the way that we've so often read it uh, as um, uh, anticipating the second coming. I think I really value this reading where it puts it back in its chronological place uh, so that we can attend to, as you said, Jesus knows what's happening. You don't. Be attentive. Um, I've said these things to you. They'll make sense in just a little while. We should mention, of course, that the beginning of the chapter talks about the destruction of the temple, right? So the the disciples, uh, many of them from Galilee, uh, are marveling at the the temple. If you've ever been to Jerusalem, you know they they're huge stones, right? The the Herodian, uh, the 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 um, rampart or the walls around the Temple Mount are still standing. Many of them uh, are much of it, and uh, and the stones are huge. <laughs> Uh, and so they're admiring this, and Jesus says to them, not one stone will be left here upon another. All will be thrown down. Of course, speaking of the destruction of that temple uh, in 70 uh, AD, by the, AD by the Romans. Yeah. So they uh, are well, astonished well, and perhaps dismayed. Catherine, you know what? Can I ask you a question? Yeah. About that? So it's, it's, it's the readers would hear both the destruction of the temple but they'd also hear that, that he's speaking about his body, right? Or, or don't you we think would, so? Exactly. We would. We yeah. would. And um, so, if, yeah, if, and the you, listeners if were read Christians. It, if you, yeah, yeah, if you read it as it's coming in this text, uh, uh, they're coming out of this uh, this magnificent facility, uh, as as Catherine, uh, you describe, and you, and. Um, they're, they're talking about it. What a, what a grand building. And Jesus says, uh, it's going to be destroyed completely. And uh, without the crucifixion and before um, the destruction of the temple, that's just an incredible statement. I mean, you don't tear down a beautifully constructed uh, facility that is in use. Mm -hmm. And um, so I can see that being a question that just hangs over their imagination. And then when the temple is destroyed, all of that stops being symbolic, which it was when Jesus was crucified. So we have both meanings. And I think that's what yeah. your question is leaning into. We have both meanings because Jesus will say, and we'll, we'll talk about this uh, 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 as we go through the Passion and the, and the Last Supper, you know, this is my body. And so we understand at the crucifixion, the body of Jesus, the temple of God being destroyed. And it has complete new meaning when this great structure is actually destroyed. So I think it's it's a uh, multi uh, valent in its memory yeah. in, in, its, in its its meaning. That's what I was getting at. So I'm sorry, Catherine, get off track. Go, no, uh, go ahead, right. back that's to right. back to your. Well, um, it's not. I I think you you may be right. It's not as explicit though, right? Because there's other right. texts where Jesus says, you know, destroy this temple, and in three days uh, I will build it again. But yeah. Here it it's so yes, and uh, here I think the emphasis really is more on the temple. Uh, that I agree. That, that Jesus, you know, Jesus says that. Look, it's gonna, uh, it's gonna be destroyed, but don't be afraid. Basically, right? Many will come in my name and say, "I'm here." But when you hear of wars and rumors of wars, do not be alarmed. Uh, this must take place, but the end is still to come. I, I, I hear. You know, I mean, the, the the destruction of the temple, the second temple, right, is such a monumental, such a traumatic event. Uh, yeah. in in the life not just of Jesus followers of course but uh, of of the Jews uh the the larger right. population of Jews uh and and it may it must have seemed just as when the first temple was destroyed it must have seemed like the end of end of the world right uh like what what do we do without the temple and Jesus wants to reassure his disciples yeah, that it's hard, but the end is not near. Don't be afraid, uh, right? This this isn't the end of this isn't the end of all things. And I and I think that bears uh, our hearing today. 
um, with so much controversy, so many disputes, uh, to use the language that we've been talking about uh, in the encounters with Jesus uh, at, that are recorded here in Mark, uh, with so much going on and there being so many conflicts, literally mm -hmm. so many wars, uh, uh, rather than trying to predict what that means for us, to take these words to heart, don't be alarmed. This must take place. If we know the Old Testament, if we are familiar with the Old Testament accounts, as are the first century followers of Jesus, then the echoes of destruction, the echoes of the failure of the people of God is uh, contiguous with the echoes of the presence of a faithful God. And so we don't need to be alarmed. We've seen this before, mm -hmm. if we know our story. God clearly has seen this before. And even when we are unfaithful, God is faithful. So we can stand firm and not be alarmed because the end is yet. The end is still to come. Um, this isn't uh, this isn't a time clock ticking down. This is life progressing until the kingdom comes.